All right, so yesterday the summit looked at our personal walk with Christ uh, and our relationships to one another as Christ's followers. But today we want to look outward at the places and people where we work. So our theme for the first part of the morning is engaging our culture with Christ-likeness. We're called to be ambassadors for Christ, representing him well as we engage in the world. And our speaker to set a framework for that is Mark Whitaker with Coca-Cola Consolidated, whom we met yesterday morning. Mark, we are excited to hear what God has put on your heart for us this morning. So please welcome Mark Whitaker back to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share. What a great event this past couple days have been. And I mean, we've learned lots of new things that we want to take back and, and even think about the things that we can do differently. So what a great iron sharpens iron experience this has been. So thank you for having this event, for the organizing, uh, Bill Hendricks and the whole, whole committee. And just thank you for also co-consolidated, having an opportunity to sponsor it and be, and be a part of it. And I'm going to share a little bit about kind of our journey at Coca-Cola Consolidated and how we became really a faith-based, purpose-driven company. So that's what I'm going to be sharing this morning. I'm going to share some of the ways how we do it, but I'm going to start off with why, why we do it. Well, it was just shy of 24 years ago, our CEO, and we're a 122-year-old company. We're the largest bottler in America. We have 104 plant sites. We're 17,600 employees, so just shy of 18,000 employees in our organization. And our chairman and CEO, Frank Harrison, just shy of 24 years ago, he was praying about this, and he said, really, this is God's company, not his company, not the board's company, not the leadership's company. This is God's company, and we're a steward for this organization at Coca-Cola Consolidated. And by the way, we are a different company than Coca-Cola Company, which is in Atlanta. Our headquarters are in, in Charlotte. Uh, we are two different organizations. They, those organizations split 122 years ago. So they're on the New York Stock Exchange. We're on the NASDAQ. Uh, we are a faith-based, purpose-driven company, and they are not a faith-based, purpose-driven company. But they are two different, two different organizations. We would be the bottler side bottles and cans, which you buy in a grocery store, and uh, uh, Walmart, a Costco, and, and CVS, and so on, uh, grocery stores and things like that. But the bottles and cans were the largest bottler in America. So, he, so he, would, he was praying about that, and I tell you what God, what told him, God told him and the leadership, and they were praying together as a group, who told him that this is God's company, and he, we need to do this God's way and be a steward. For this, I mean, when you look at 2 Corinthians 5.20, for example, in the New Testament, I mean, God is clear that if you're a Christian, we're an ambassador for Christ. And that just doesn't mean on Sundays during church. That means Monday through Fridays. Also, we are an ambassador for Jesus. We are ambassadors for Christ until we join Jesus in heaven. So that means every minute of the day, not just uh, our spiritual life on weekends and so it does include our Monday through, through Fridays. What we don't want to do, and kind of what he felt was happening before that, is people turned that switch off on Monday mornings. They were Christians, but when they got to work, they turned the switch off on Monday morning. So how do you keep Monday through Friday, how do you do that to keep Monday through Friday uh, where it's actually, you include your faith in your work? And I'm going to be sharing a little bit about how we do that. Not the only way to do it, but how we do it at Coca-Cola Consolidated. And other things that was heavy on their mind, when you look at, when you look, for example, at is our work important to God, and I know this is uh, probably, uh, probably something you think about a lot, but I think it's important to, to just to remind everybody, when you think about is our work important to God, think about Genesis 2.15. What is the first thing that God did when he created Adam? The first thing that God did when he created Adam, he put Adam to work. In the Garden of Eden, Genesis 2.15. And then when he created Eve, he put her to work in the garden to maintain the garden. So God is showing that work is important uh, to God. What about to Jesus? What can we learn about in the New Testament how important work is? Uh, Well, think about it. 132 public appearances of Jesus in Scripture, 132, 
Are you aware that 122 of them were in a marketplace setting? 122 of Jesus' public appearances were in a marketplace setting. 92% of Jesus' public appearances in Scripture are in the marketplace. So he's showing us that there's no better place to include your faith and no better place for ministry than the workplace itself. And then also the disciples. Think about where the 12 disciples came from. They didn't come from the synagogue or the temple. Every one of those, every one of those disciples came from the marketplace. Doctor, fisherman, tax collector, but every one of them from the workplace. And where did they go back to after Jesus poured into them and discipled them for three years? They went back to the marketplace. So now you have Peter out in the Sea of Galilee and fishing. And he's fishing to make a living and put a roof over his head and, and food on the table. But he's also fishing for men. He's doing things differently. He's integrating his faith in his work. And I tell you, it's so clear in the New Testament, there's no better instructions for us to, to do our work than what we learn in the New Testament. So that's why we do what we do at Coca-Cola Consolidated. We've been a faith-based company, purpose-driven for 23 years now. And I'm going to share a little bit, a little bit of how we do that. And like I said, we're publicly traded. So think about this. If we can do this as a publicly traded company on the NASDAQ, you can do this. We've never once had a lawsuit in 23 years. I don't even know of an HR complaint that we've had in 23 years doing some of the things that we're doing. And I'm going to share that because when you love people and you love on people and you care for people and you listen to people and you have empathy for people, who's going to fight against that? And that's what we learned from, that's what we learned from Jesus. So our official purpose statement is to honor God in all we do by serving others, pursuing excellence, and growing profitably. And we heard a lot about the, the pursuing excellence also here at, at the conference. It even came up uh, quite a bit at our at our panel yesterday, God wants us to do things with excellence. But think about this, to honor God in all we do by serving others, pursuing excellence, and growing profitably is our official purpose statement. Now, that's easy to put on a wall and you have your HR onboarding and, and give them a copy of your purpose statement. But how do you bring that to life? And that's what I want to share a few minutes now is how you bring that to life. Well, we have 10 values and by the way, our 10 values are all scripture-based. These are the values that we feel to live out our purpose statement to honor God in all we do by serving others, which is morality, integrity, humility. We find humility is so important. Respectfulness, supportiveness. You can see them there. I'm not going to list each one. But these values are scripture-based. And we have what's called a one-team app. It's almost like our LinkedIn for our 17,600 employees, how we can communicate, we can post, we can reply to post. And it's amazing how often, uh, even very recently, that we do actually training and retraining. Just we cho choose a value of the week, for example. And we'll share somebody that's living out that value and share stories around that value. So it's not something you can just have one time and have these values from 23 years ago. It's something you got to continue we feel like redundancy is our friend, and it's something we got to continue to emphasize that we want our employees, our 17,600 teammates, to live out these values. Now, another thing I want to uh, really emphasize, a question we frequently get, get, probably one of the most frequently asked questions, well, how do you hire somebody? When you come in and you've got a purpose statement, you're doing the onboarding, and it says to uh, Honor God in all you do by serving others, pursuing excellence, and growing properly. What happens if they don't believe in God? To be honest with you, we hope they don't believe in God because we see it's an opportunity to introduce them to God. It's an outreach opportunity. And I'm going to go a little bit more in detail on that in a minute when I talk about our chaplaincy program. So what we say is this. You don't have to believe in God to join us. But these 10 values, they're non-negotiable. These are the values of a servant leader and they're non-negotiable. Who wouldn't want to live out morality, integrity, humility? Who would not want to live out these? Consistency, discipline. Everyone would. And probably if they didn't want to live out these values, they may not be the right one to be working our company anyway. But we do tell them they don't have to believe in God, but these values are non-negotiable. Are non and like I said, it is an outreach opportunity, so 
uh, we hope a lot of them don't believe in God because what a great place to introduce individuals to God is in the workplace. Now, how do you do this with uh, training your leadership to live out those values and to live out this purpose statement? We want to share a little bit about our training for our leadership. It's called the LEADS training. This is really critical, this is, because we want our leaders not just to have in those plants the most bottles and cans that they can get out per, per year in that plant site or the most revenues and most profits they get out of the plant site. For sure, it's important uh, to be an efficient company and continue to grow and to grow properly as part of our, our purpose statement. But we also want our leadership to have a chaplain's heart. To L for, the leads, L is for listen, E for empathy. We want, we want them to care about the employees. And, and the A for advocate, we want our leaders to be the biggest cheerleader for employees, to be their advocate. D for develop, we want, to, we want our leadership to actually develop their employees more than they do themselves. D for develop. S for self-reflection and prayer, to be praying about what you did during the week, what you wish you would have done differently and do differently on Monday. But listen, empathy, and when we, do our, when we do our engagement surveys called the Pulse, we do them each September with our teammates, We're, we really look at that. Are we listening well? Do we have enough empathy in our leadership for the, the employees that we're supervising and we're leading? I mean, that's really important to us. It's not just, that's why we do the engagement survey. It's not just about, again, how many bottles and cans and how much we grew revenue-wise and profit-wise. It's about how much we care, how much we listen. And who doesn't want to have someone that they work with, either a peer, a supervisor, or a subordinate, who doesn't want to have someone that listens well, that has empathy for them, that cares about their whole family. So that's, uh, that's how, we, how we train our leadership. And I know it sounds simple, but this is a pretty detailed uh, training process. It was all developed in-house. And by the way, each one of these are also scripture-based. So these aren't man, these are are God's ways of how better we can lead, which is listening, empathy, advocate, develop, and self-reflection and prayer. Now, some of the best practices that I want to share. So you have, you know, we have a purpose statement to honor God and all we do by serving others, pursuing excellence and growing profitably. Now, how do we bring that alive? How do we not just become a, uh, become a sign on the wall? Because it, like you walk in our headquarters, you walk in the plants, you're going to see our, our purpose statement. Donner God and all we do by serving others. But how do you bring that alive? Well, like I said, leads training. I have that up there at top. Leads training uh, is important. And then also what we've done, and we started this 23 years ago, is chaplaincy. We, in our, we started with a chaplain in our Nashville plant uh, 23 years ago. And just uh, a beta test. Uh, first, uh, our CEO, Frank Harrison, was told, no, don't. Don't uh, get a chaplain. Don't pray. Lock your door when you pray. You can't do that. It's not legal. And then he was talking to Joe Gibbs, and, uh, who was Washington Redskins, and then NASCAR, and he had a chaplain. Then he was visiting Clemson University, our CEO was, and down the hall from Bobby Bowden when he was at Clemson University. He had a chaplain. And Frank Harrison asked, you can do this? I said, oh, yeah, you can do this. You can't force someone to see a chaplain, but you can have a chaplain to be there, to care for your employees to listen, care, be an advocate for, just like our leadership. You can do that. So we hired Corporate Chaplains of America 23 years ago, and we have a 23-year partnership with them, and it's been such a great, a great partnership. We had a chaplain in our Nashville plant, and about a year later, the plant, uh, plant leadership contacted our CEO and said, if you take that chaplain out of our Nashville plant, we're going to have riots in the street that it had such an impact. Retention rates have increased. Suicides have been prevented. Marriages have been saved. So now, right away, when he heard that, we have a chaplain at every plant. That was a beta test, the Nashville plant. So now we have 104 plant sites in the United States, 17,600 employees, and have a chaplain at every plant. It's almost a chaplain on average for about every 200 employees. Where a chaplain can have a touch point, our goal is that they can have a touch point often. We, pr we hope to even, even every day, but at least a few times a week. But a chaplain can have a touch point with every employee every week, and we're hoping even a few days each week. 
I mean, that's important where a child says, how are you doing to an employee? It, it, you know, what you told me last week about, about your spouse uh, being treated for cancer, how things are going there, and is there anything we need to go talk about, which we call a care session, if they go beyond just, uh, uh, just for a couple minutes. A care session is usually 20 minutes and longer, where a chaplain is really meeting with that employee and talking with that employee and pouring into that employee, encouraging that employee and being there for them. And then the chaplain is not allowed to tell us, leadership, HR, or anyone in the organization what was discussed. So it's a safe place. So they could have, they could have someone in their family with an alcohol problem or a drug problem. Maybe even them themselves is going through some things. That will never be shared with the leadership or the HR department. And I tell you what that becomes. Over 23 years, a very safe place where the employee can be vulnerable, can share and I tell you, we've learned out of all of our faith initiatives, one of the most important and probably one of the best places to start, besides prayer, we started with prayer groups, but besides praying together as a leadership team, which was the start and the beginning of faith initiatives and co-consolidated, chaplaincy has been such an important step for us and has had such an impact in our organization. I think I mentioned yesterday that we've averaged in it averaged in 2022 about 50 salvations and recommits per month for employees in 2022. Our most recent full year, 2023, it was 1,361 recommits and salvations of our employees. That's 113 per month. And this year, the first few months of this year have even been higher than that. But could you just imagine 113 recommits and salvations of your employees per month? Thank God we're, meet, we're hiring some that don't believe in God yet. Because what a great opportunity for them to get to know God. It's a ministry that just happens to be in the beverage business. And what a great, uh, what a great season it is and how God's led for us and our organization to, do, to, do, uh, to be a faith-based, purpose-driven company. And then uh, prayer groups, we have several different prayer groups. Several of them I get to, to lead myself with employees. I got, for example, just to give you an example, and I just had one yesterday with them, rural in the morning with two truck drivers uh, in, in, in Indiana, Jeremiah Clark and Chris Papa. And, and it's great. They're, we're virtual in meetings, and they're, they've got their camera and their trucks in the background, and they're delivering, and they're at a Kroger or at a Walmart or a Costco, and... And they're sharing, uh, you know, we're sharing and praying together. I mean, I tell you, I find it, and I've been an uh, opportunity to do this for almost six years now. I find it some of the most exciting and the most productive and the most encouraging part of my week is these prayer time with our employees, prayer time with our employees. And they, we share, we pray for each other, we share our challenges. Some of them I've been praying with, like one named Todd Marty, for six years so now we share and share our vulnerabilities, share some challenges that we may have going on in our family, and pray for each other. Nothing more important to have prayer warriors and pray together. Bible studies, we also have Bible studies in the organization. We use uh, Right Now Media. We have subscription for all of our teammates for Right Now Media for great content. And I know they're out, uh, out here uh, too as one of, the, of one of the sponsors, but what a great content that's been for us. It's in 10 languages. I think they have 20, 25,000 uh, sources of, of information, but been a great uh, partner for us is Right Now Media. More recently, uh, um, Julia Altman's joined us about a year ago. We hired her from, from Zurich. I mentioned that yesterday, yesterday morning, and she's adding even more layers and even more initiatives and it's so great to see those come alive. For example, in November, she, she launched a devotional, a weekly devotional. And this is very unique. Just three to five minutes long, weekly devotional. It's audio, so that way our truck drivers can listen to it. Someone on a forklift can listen to it. We're a very blue-collar company. We have about 800 employees at our corporate office and, and another 17,000 in plant sites. So very blue-collar, but being audio is a really good direction uh, to go. And a neat thing that she decided when we launched this devotional. She prepares the devotionals, Julia does, and she has other sources, even Corporate Chapel of America and some others that she uses to help create that, uh, these weekly devotionals that we launch every Monday morning, a great way to start your week. But she has a different employee actually share that audio devotional. So we'll have someone from leadership. We've had some very high level, executive vice president level, share 
share devotionals. But then there also be some ones that just live working in the plant that has no subordinates. So it's a variety of different employees where someone can listen to devotional and they can hear their colleague uh, be one of them sharing it, can be a, a, their supervisor sharing it. And what a great way to, to, to engage your, your other Christians in the company is where they can be part of this devotional. And that way every Monday, the teammates are hearing a different voice sharing this uh, weekly devotional. Also, she just launched in, in March... Uh, kind of a chapel service starting at our corporate office and it's kind of a beta test and it could be an opportunity that we could even take to some of our our plant sites just like we did chaplaincy we started at one site now it's at every at every site but our corporate office she started just before Easter what a great time to to launch it and it's called the gathering faith fellowship and food the gathering faith fellowship and food and it's uh free lunch so that's always uh, an attraction to to get people to, to show up. And we've had great turnouts at the, the first that we've had since March. We do it uh, the last Tuesday of, of every month. And what a great turnout and what a great way for someone to share a message, let a different employee share a message and let ones that also attend, maybe some of them just for the free lunch and don't even know God yet. What a great opportunity for them to hear a message. And they can become one of these 113 plus uh, 113 per month of our recommits and salvations. So it is a great outreach opportunity. And this was another great layer that we added. Volunteerism, volunteerism uh, is very important to us. And one of the places where we have a lot of active volunteerism, and you see there we call our rapid response team. We built that, started that about seven, about seven years ago. And a rapid response team is very similar, similar to what Samaritan's Purse has. So we have three full-time employees that, for example, we had a tornado in Little Rock uh, about a year ago. You may recall that. And this is for hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, uh, uh, floods in their, in their basements, lot storms, many different reasons that a teammate has a challenge. And our rapid response team shows up very quickly and helps them put on new roofs after storms, help them clean up uh, floods in their basement, help them clean up fires and sometimes they have to help clean up the, it's so destroyed that the whole house they have to kind of help them find some of the things that maybe were pictures and stuff that they didn't want to lose but the actual house has to be replaced that happened in a couple cases one with a fire very recently in the last two or three weeks and also with a, with some of the ones with a tornado in Little Rock and the neat thing about this rapid response team we use a lot of volunteerism a lot of times they have 10 or 20 employees working alongside of them Whoever's the closest to that particular location from that particular plant site. What a great opportunity when you're helping a teammate clean up after a storm or clean up after a flood. And you've got three full-time people and all the equipment that's needed. And a semi-truck with all the equipment, the chainsaws and so on. But then you've got those employees there, the volunteers, their teammates working alongside of them in, in, the, in the cleanup. So that's a rapid response team, very similar to like the Samaritan's Purse has been a great addition. Increased giving, our giving has increased greatly uh, over the years. And you look at the average public company is 1% giving of pre-tax profit. We're significantly higher than that, exponentially higher than that. And God has led us to, to go much higher than that. We go about as high as you could probably go being a publicly traded, publicly traded company with not having challenges uh, with our shareholders. But God, share, God is clear about giving. So, and we feel like the more we give, the more God blesses our business. You can't outgive God. You cannot outgive God. God has so blessed our business. We also have a mentoring program called Radical Mentoring. Two mature believers and eight mentees that are young believers, new believers or young believers. And that's a one year program, three hours per month. And what a great program! That is, we even have several new groups just starting here over the next 60 to 90, 90 days in radical mentoring. Some groups women and some groups men, but it's a faith-based uh, mentoring program. We have a new program, and Julie is actually the one leading this, a new initiative that we're just launching this month called the Servant Leaders Award. And that's the ones that are living out our values, our 10 values, and living out our purpose statement to honor God and all we do. And that would be each market unit. And so it would be a lot of exposure. And just think for the other employees to see that live out. Who gets these servant leader awards 
And, and, and that, again, is great examples for them living out our purpose statement and living out our values. It's another way to remind them how important our purpose statement is to our organization, how important it is, it, it is to God. Uh, regarding the giving, I tell you one of the things that touched my heart the most, uh, the years that I've been with, uh, the six years that I've been with Coca-Cola Consolidated as leading, as vice president of culture and care uh, department, the, the probably that's been most touching to me was 2020 when COVID hit. I saw something I've never seen in corporate America, and I've worked for three other Fortune 500 companies prior to Coca-Cola Consolidated in my lifetime. And when COVID hit in March of 2020, we didn't even know how the year was going to be for us at Coca-Cola Consolidated. And our CEO made a decision. He said, Frank Harrison, you know, we should be giving more than ever. People are going to be hurting. And it doesn't matter how our organization does. We really ought to be looking out more than ever. God wants us to look out more than ever for other people, no matter what our financial results may be. And our employees, because we're on the bottles and can side, people home more, they drink more. And by the way, we're Dasani water, smart water, vitamin water, fair life milk. We're 301 beverages. It's not just Coke and Diet Coke. It's 301 beverages. You may not uh, know that. Monster Energy, Body Armor, all those are our Go Peak Tea. All those are Coke products. So people home more, they drink more. And so our business, our employees were working overtime, but a lot of their spouses were hit. A lot of their spouses were hit with the... Uh, with COVID, so, so they, their business was closed down, so therefore they did lose their job. And we put a benevolence fund together, and we covered hundreds of employees' expenses to help them cover their mortgages, their rent, their kids' college, their car payments, hundreds. And some of those was happening for almost a year. So that's, uh, that's another way of giving. I never saw anything like that. It was almost the opposite of what we saw in corporate America. In the end of that year in 2020, it was a record year in the history of the company. So even by giving that and not knowing what, what God was going to do with that, God gave a record year in the history of the company. So we go through this in detail. It's called T-Factor. T-Factor is where we share with the world what I've been sharing with you in much more detail and love to have you at a T-Factor event. We're actually doing one in Dallas in person on September 5th. And if you go to t-factor.com, it has that uh, about the September 5th event. Uh, we'd love to have you there. It's noon to four. It's free of charge. It's free lunch right in the Highland Park Methodist Church right here nearby, about four miles from here. And we're going to have a T-Factor event in person on September 5th. If you go to t-factor.com or if you go to the Highland Park Methodist Church website, you'll see the link on there also where you can register. So I, that's what I wanted to share with you. And now I'm going to bring a panel up uh, where we can really discuss this uh, in, a little bit more, in a little bit more detail about their thoughts. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Dylan Musser and uh, I currently serve... Uh, as the campus director at Vanderbilt University for the Navigators, uh, as well as a cultural engagement fellow here at Dallas Theological Seminary through the Hendricks Center uh, for, for Cultural Engagement. So, happy to be here. Good morning. My name is Jessica Rimmer, and I am with Solomon Strategic Advisors, which is a um, organizational leadership company that helps teams and organizations grow through healthy leadership. And I think I got looped in because of Polished. I'm the co-director of Polished Oklahoma City, which is a faith and work organization for women. Hi, Bill Peel. Uh, I uh, graduated from this seminary 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago, that is. And uh, about uh, a few years later, back in 1987, I left. I came out from behind the pulpit and started discipling people in the workplace. And so it's a really, really fun time. But I did that for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's the most important place where we, people are spiritually formed. It is also the most strategic venue for evangelism. And I've had a few organizations pay me to do that, to be good at that. Uh, the Christian Medical Association, Letourneau University, for example. Today, I have to be good for nothing. I have my own little organization called 24-7 Faith that I do that through. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Tom Hawes. I'm a part of an organization called C12. It's an international organization that's dedicated to serving the needs of Christian CEOs and business owners. The, um, the tagline we use is helping them build great businesses 
So that means successful businesses, successful platforms for a greater purpose. And the greater purpose is God's purposes at work. And so a lot of the stuff that Mark has described, uh, we evangelize to, to Christian CEOs around the world. Great, great. Well, let's start with this. Let's start back with what, uh, go a little bit more deeper in what God says and what the, the New Testament says about our work being important to God. I shared a little bit about 2 Corinthians 5.20, about us being uh, God's ambassador. Shared a little bit about Jesus showed us by example of how many times he was in the workplace, 122 out of 132 total, 92% of his, his public appearances were in the workplace. We'd love to, get, love to get some of your input there. It doesn't matter who'd like to go first, but to share about what you, how you feel about what God says about our work and, and what, how God sh- shares with us clearly that work is important to God. I bet y'all are going to go ladies first, aren't you? Um, so I would say, um, it has been really good news to me that work matters to God and, and recognizing that work was not, uh, work wasn't the curse, right? That, that actually we were given work in the garden. So it existed before and after the curse. And I remember there are a couple of verses that really impacted me in college. I went to Oklahoma Baptist university. I was trying to be a missionary. Turns out the Lord set me towards the marketplace more recently Um, but it was really good news to me when I recognized that work was something that God put into our hearts. And when I read Ephesians 2.10, right, that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works and that we don't have to make them up. We don't have to figure them out all by ourselves. He has created us to do good works that he prepared ahead of time. And so that that pathway just came about discovering what is God's good work for me to do. And... um, And I think that now I'm kind of on a mission to help other people recognize work should not be toil. Work should not crush you. And and I think right now what I see in the work that I do is that work crushes a lot of people. And that as believers in the workplace, our good work is to push back that darkness and to help people thrive, help people flourish in the workplace. And so I think... It's just really good news to me that God's not mad about work, that, that somehow working in the marketplace isn't secondary ministry, and that every, every Christian can be on mission in the marketplace. Good, great. Uh, maybe, maybe to add to that, uh, I have a business owner that a few years ago was a little discouraged with work. He's, uh, he's burned out. He made a lot of money. What's my purpose here? And he said, I'm going to sell my company. And... Uh, he was struggling with the question of why his work in a, a broader way mattered and, and what that meant. And uh, there's two things that we run into with Christian CEOs and business owners. One, they think their work matters too much, mm. right? And then the second is they don't recognize why it has value to God. And it's not just the productive aspect to it. It's the fact that that's where the people are. It's just really simple. You know, as a social construct, people are brought together on a regular basis uh, for work purposes, and that person, particularly a leader, like you gave examples, Mark, of your CEO, they are incredibly influential to build cultures which affect people who show up every day <laughs> to hear about that culture and to get the, get the uh, biblical instruction either directly or indirectly from it. So... It's a way to bring people together. You have access to them, and uh, we have to honor that for God's purposes. Um, yeah, I think one of the unique things that we see throughout the scriptures is that um, the Bible opens in a garden, uh, but it closes in Revelation with a city, actually. And so we see this development throughout the scriptures that the things that we create and the cultures that we create as humans uh, are not ultimately going to be eradicated by God, but they're actually going to be purified and redeemed by Christ when he returns. And so I just love at the end of Revelation, in Revelation 21, uh, we see uh, a new city, uh, a heavenly Jerusalem coming down from heaven uh, where God will dwell with his people. And one of my favorite passages in this chapter is in verse 24 where it says, uh, by the light of the Lord, the nations will walk in this new city, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. 
So this tells me that the cultures and the things that we create in our workplaces and in our businesses on earth are not going to be uh, eradicated by God, but they're actually going to be redeemed and renewed and that we will actually bring these things that we're creating now into the new heavens and the new earth. Um, and so this, that trajectory totally changes how I view my work in the present, that these are things that are going to be used by God for his redemptive purposes. And that totally changes um, everything. Yeah, this is, this is so important, obviously. Uh, it, work is about being human. This is who we are, and uh, and so when, especially when you have uh, Christian business owners that can bring that kind of uh, compassion, care for people, give them great jobs, it's a huge impact and helps them become, helps us all become more human as as they offer these kind of jobs, uh, and it becomes very formative uh, in people's lives. But the other part of this, uh, assuming that. A, a, Assuming that the business is doing a good job at that, assuming you're, even as a, a worker, are taking your square foot or inch or whatever of creation that you have domain over and are doing that well, it becomes a huge way to influence other people that are still on their journey to God. And, uh, you know, I mentioned that it, it is, the workplace has been, since the beginning of the church, the most important venue uh, for evangelism if you want to say it like that. It's the most important venue for having redemptive conversations, if you don't like the word evangelism. You know, in the world, it always has been. The early church grew from a few hundred on the day of Pentecost to six million, 300 years later, because people took their faith to work, and they worked next to somebody, and guess what? They started liking these people, and they wanted to know what made them tick. And that's how the, the church grew during that time. It's the same thing today as well. It, this is the most important place, you know, for the spread of the gospel in the world, in the workplace. And so these two things of discipleship and evangelism, you know, really bring uh, an incredible importance of, you know, of, uh, of the workplace to, uh, to all of us as Christians. I remember Chuck Colson, you say that, I remember Chuck Colson discipling me 27 years ago, and, and when I became a, a Christian at, at age 40, I remember him emphasizing, and you'd ask him, you know, what the purpose of his life is, and he could sum that up in two, two scripture, Matthew 28, 19, and 2 Timothy 2, 2, and what you just said, evangelism and discipleship, you know, Matthew 28, 19, as uh, plant seeds to the ones who don't know God yet plant seeds and just pray that they will get to know God. In 2 Timothy 2, 2, like Paul did Timothy, Paul poured into Timothy, already a believer, and said, Timothy, take these things you learned from me and go share with others, you know, the, the discipleship part. And, and, uh, and it's amazing that, and I, I feel strongly now being on this journey myself the last 27 years, that that is the purpose of our life, evangelism and discipleship. And it doesn't matter if you're in a workplace, an Uber, or a grocery store, or a post office, or at home, or at church. It doesn't matter where you're at. That's the purpose of our life. And I love like what Bill Hendricks said uh, yesterday, and I think a great reminder for all of us is, I work for Coca-Cola Consolidated, but I'm in full-time ministry. No matter where you work as a Christian, we're in full-time ministry. And I think that's such a reminder coming here and in here and that, and, and evangelism and discipleship is that ministry. You know, I think it's really important though to understand that discipleship is not just teaching somebody to have a quiet time in the morning. It's about living out this, the reality of Christ in, in our lives. And, uh, and by the way, that's why evangelism and spiritual formation or discipleship go together. Uh, and I love, there's been, a, there's kind of been, a, have you noticed kind of a loose, uh, division between those two here that you they kind of uh, kind of weave themselves into each other and I think that's really important can you actually start discipling person before they, you evangelize them absolutely and that's what Coke Consolidate is doing so well uh, in this and that sets somebody up in some ways to be more attentive to the gospel when the Holy Spirit draws draws them closer mm. I think that leads to, to a great next question for, 
for our panelists. And we talked about some of the things that we, that we do at Coca-Cola and Consolidate. It's not the only way to do it, but it's where God has led us. Uh, um, I think our CEO, Frank Harrison, was really impacted. He's been on Billy Graham's board for a couple of decades and was really impacted and still is on their board. Billy Graham Association, and I think it impacted when Billy Graham said a couple decades ago that the next big revival will be, the next revival will be in the marketplace, and I think that impacted Frank Harrison, and is why, is one of the reasons why we do put so much emphasis in being a, a faith-based, purpose-driven company. What are some other examples? I shared some, some things that we do, prayer groups, rapid response team, or giving, or chaplaincy. What's some, what's some other examples that the panelists uh, would be aware of that, that are other ways to live this out besides what maybe I shared at, at, that we're doing at Coca-Cola Consolidated? No, no, please go, Tom. Um, you, you gave a pretty extensive list. Uh, so, And it's growing. By going to conferences like this, we learn and grow. And I'm afraid of Julia to talk to her when she gets back now. She says, hey, I thought of this. Let's start this initiative. <laughs> we, we have um, business owners on a very similar journey that you described for your uh, company. And I was trying to think of what were some distinct and additive things compared to what you, you described. Um, mission trips. So we have a number of businesses that have organized mission trips. And oh, by the way, they've constructed them in such a way that they take unbelieving uh, employees with them. It's an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. So they're traveling to a place and doing construction or something, a service that someone who doesn't believe in Christ could say, that's still a good thing, and let's go. So the companionship of Christians as they demonstrate love to others, is, I, I love what you said, Bill, is that it uh, is discipleship. Mm. And I think the, the, the main thing, because I, I deal with CEOs a lot, and their personal example means so much. Yeah. yeah, there are plenty of activities to form, there's plenty of stuff to do, but when the employees and when the customers of that company and the vendors of that company see the impact on the CEO, him or her, um, in, in radical ways. Um, I have one CEO, and he is known as an abrupt kind of speaker. I don't, can you imagine a CEO being like that? You know, just <laughs> <laughs> do this, do that. And I was talking to him uh, this week, and I, I asked him, I said, how, how have you changed, you know, over the years? What will you self-assess? What have you changed? How have you changed? And he said, I listen more kind of back to one of your, your uh, leads thing. Yeah. And, and I will tell you that the witness of him listening is one of the most profound impacts that he's had on his organization. Mm -hmm. So personal examples. I think building on that, and I'm going to use my own business as kind of the answer um, to the question, but the, our methodology is we use leadership language to help leaders get healthy because we do believe leaders define culture, sub-leaders define subculture. So our job is to go in and help leaders get healthy. Well, nearly everyone on our team, nearly everyone who works with us um, is on the journey to Christian maturity. Not everyone. Well, they're all on the journey, okay? I should say they're all on the journey, um, not meaning like they've accepted Christ, but they're all, you know, moving towards Jesus because Jesus is moving towards them. Um, and, and as we do the work to help other people get healthier, that 100x model we use from Giant Worldwide, um, we're, we're using leadership language, but we're using spiritual eyes. So one of the things that I learned a long time ago is before you talk to people about Jesus, make sure you're talking to Jesus about the people, kind of that, that model. I think I was raised as a solid Southern Baptist, and I felt a lot of um, pressure that I needed to share Jesus without fear. And I would forget to take the step of praying for the people. And so we in our business try to really, I mean, pray about the work. Pray about the work. Pray about the sessions. Pray about the clients. And make sure that we're listening to the Holy Spirit. And we actually kind of train the team. How do you listen to the Holy Spirit in your coaching sessions or in your leadership development training, um, not that you're then busting out the Romans road in the middle of your leadership development, because that could get weird. That does not go on the slides. But, um, <laughs> but if you understand 
uh, you know, Paul and the Acropolis did this. If you understand culture and you understand the businesses well enough, you can use the leadership language and bring spiritual concepts without um, preaching at the people, right? And so you're, you're calling and provoking health in the leaders so that you're pushing back darkness in the businesses and you're making space for people to flourish. And so that's kind of, I mean, it's, it's very integrated in the way that we do our work, but that's how we're training our team members to see their life as ministry, to see their work as, you know, kind of that redemptive act mm. and to help business leaders do the same, whether or not they would say, yes, I want to be a Christian CEO. Cause many of our, I've got several CEOs that I work with that are not super friendly to the gospel, super friendly to Jesus, but we know Jesus is very interested in them. And so we're using leadership language to create health that is spiritually derived, heavenly wisdom with language they can hold on to. Very good. Very good. Anyone else like to comment on that on some, maybe some other examples that you're observing in your own organization or other organizations that you're familiar with? Well, you know, whether, whether you're the leader at the top or the, the bottom new hire, you know, the, uh, as a Christian, our, our work should speak for itself in some ways, although it doesn't. Uh, we do have to explain why we're different, but our work ought to say something. Of the quality of our work, our commitment to being a leader, our commitment to, uh, you know, delivering, you know, a case of Coke or whatever it is that, that we're doing. Uh, that's, I mean, that's kind of ground zero, you know, for our, our witness and our discipleship and our influence on other people. But then need, people need to see, you know, Christ in us in some ways as well. And when we do, we, people pay attention when we do good work. And uh, when, they, when they start paying attention, they see Christ in us. And especially, well, that gives our words authority uh, and our influence authority when we do that. When we add concern for them, then sometimes they really want to listen to us. And when they see that in us wherever we are, Jessica, we were talking about, Jessica's a there-you-are person. Mm. And uh, when we approach people like that, there you are, rather than here I am. Uh, it makes an impression on them, and they may want to know more about why we're different than we are. Yeah, I, I, I think that is such a key, is that, is that relational. There's, there's the relational element, I think, in everything that y'all have shared. And I think um, just on, on a cultural level and, and what I'm seeing on a, a very elite college campus right now with people that are, are leaving this university and, and going into many of your workplaces – um, that on, on, just on a cultural level, I think we all, f- as followers of Jesus, and, and you as, as, um, as business owners and, and employees, we need to be students of the culture. We need to understand the kinds of questions that people are asking if we are going to effectively engage with people uh, with the hope of the gospel. Because if we don't know the kinds of questions people are asking, we're going to ultimately uh, walk in carrying a hammer thinking that everything is a nail and we're going to do more destruction than good. And I think if we understand the questions that people have, if we understand the kinds of things that people are curious about, we're going to be able to speak into those spaces and places in ways that are actually effective to communicate the hope of the gospel. And so I just want to encourage you to um, really get to know um, you're the people in your spheres and what are the things that you're hearing them talk about and say? What are some of these cultural narratives that you're noticing and hearing? And I think we have to say as followers of Jesus that each cultural narrative, right, we believe in God's common grace towards all of us, that each cultural narrative does aspire to something good in some way, right? People rightly want to be free, People rightly want justice. People rightly want an open and pluralistic society. These are good things. But our job as followers of Jesus in the workplaces and elsewhere is to help show them that it is only in Christ that these aspirations can be truly fulfilled. And so we, have, we, can, we can both uh, connect and confront at the same time. And I think if we do that in our workplaces and we understand the questions people are asking, we will be more effective ministers of the gospel 
wherever we're working. Mark, do you mind if I build on that? Because I think that that cultural tuning or that cultural attunement is so important. And I think we see Jesus do this, right? Like we watch him and I was taught, like, here's how you share the gospel. And I'm grateful. Like I love an ABC. I'm going to bridge. I'm going to like, I'm going to do every evangelism explosion. Like I'm going to do all the things in my head. But when it comes to how did Jesus share himself, right? How did he share the message of the kingdom? Well, he always, someone would say, well, how, how am I? how am I going to be saved? And you will go sell everything. Well, that's, I've never heard a preacher say that from the stage and everybody would run away, but Jesus was always tuned in with the person and with the cultural moment, the sermon on the Mount or his flips, his script flipping. He's like, you've heard it said, but I say to you, right? That Jesus was always attuned to the way people were thinking at the time. Um, Now, I think sometimes we back away from that because we're like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to lose my way of thinking here. I don't want to lose my biblical framework, but we have to start where people start so that we can help them think from heavenly wisdom and not earthly, yeah. earthly wisdom. Yeah. And I, just to that, I think Jessica is so right in this. And, and one of the things that we're seeing now too, is that um, we have to not assume that your coworkers have generic religious beliefs anymore. Um, because what you just gave as an example, evangelism explosion, the bridge to life, all of these things, all of those evangelistic principles assume that people have a working framework for some of these generic religious beliefs. So, you know, you believe in God, you vaguely believe in an afterlife, you generally believe in sin, maybe have some vague concepts of those things. My job then in those examples is to then step in and connect the religious dots, basically. Um, to say, you already have these generic religious beliefs, now I'm going to turn them into specifically Christian beliefs. Um, but now we have to say, what happens when the dots are not even there? Right. How do you share your faith then? When they don't even know, they don't, even, they don't believe in sin, they don't believe in an afterlife, they don't believe in God. How do, you connect, how do you communicate your faith then? And that's where we have to be good students of the culture. So Dylan, <laughs> this is your world, okay? How do you resurrect the, the dot of I'm sin and separated from God? Because when, when I was at the university, that was, that was a given. So when somebody came along with the four spiritual laws, uh, that, okay, we got, we got that. Now, okay, there's, that's why Jesus is important. But... The, you know, I talk to people all the time, and I, and I know this is, you know, your world here, that sin, what, what is sin? Sin is somebody's rules, trying to encroach on my freedom. How do you, how do you get that across? Uh, and, and with, obviously, we're talking about, you know, in the workplace now, so you're not, you're not preaching at somebody, but how do, you, how, do you, how do you get them to that place? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's a couple things. I think the first thing is that we have to broaden our understanding of what sin is. So typically, especially in the college campus, and I'm sure in your workplaces, like when people think of sin, they maybe probably think of somebody saying, you are a sinner, uh, which is true. They're separated from God. But we need to broaden our understanding to, to actually communicate what the Bible actually teaches about sin, which is this idea of corruption, that sin has corrupted every aspect of creation, that it has pervaded the world that we now live in, so, that, so much so that there is no aspect of creation now that is not touched by the pervasive effects of sin. So in actuality, when we, when we broaden our categories in that way, people do have a concept of sin. They see the brokenness of the world around them. They see that clearly things are not the way they are supposed to be. So they do have some category in that sense. But then the other thing, I think, is that, again, we need to be looking at the cultural narratives that people are telling themselves, the stories that people are telling about what is good, true, and beautiful. And when we're able to do that, we're able to actually redirect those desires, redirect those narratives towards their ultimate fulfillment in Christ. And this is what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 1. So Paul Uh, goes through this list in 1 Corinthians 1, and he says, hey, the Jews want power and the Greeks want wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, the wisdom of God and the power of God. And so Paul doesn't say, Jews, you want wisdom, Greeks, you want, or Greeks, you want wisdom, Jews, you want power. Like, that is so stupid. Why would you want those things? He redirects their good desires 
to show them that their ultimate fulfillment is found in Christ himself. Hey, if you really want true power, if you really want true wisdom, look to Christ and him crucified, where you will see both the wisdom of God and the power of God. And I think that tactic that Paul uses, we have to do that in our workplaces. What are these narratives that you're hearing, and how can you redemptively recover them and redirect them towards Christ? You know, I was, I was sitting there thinking, while you were talking about that, brokenness is real apparent, you know, in running businesses all the time. And what, what part do you think... Uh, uh, being, being the leader of a company, for example, uh, wh- why, would, why would being, you know, humbly admitting those things rather than trying to hide some of the brokenness, which could be pretty typical, you know, to come out of what, you know, my employees to know this or that about what's going on. Where does humility come in there as a, as a teaching tool, but also an attracting tool as well to the gospel, do you think? These aren't a lot of humble people. <laughs> well, I say that, and I, 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 don't, mean it, uh, I don't mean it 100%. I, I mean, in the context of their business, uh, humility is often, plenty of exceptions to this, but humility is, is not a valued attribute many times um, because you are, you are called to make decisions, often hard decisions. You're hiring, you're firing. You're, you're making decisions that employees don't get to make, and humility, improperly thought of, is seen as a weakness. And so there's a conversion step to understand the example of Christ, to say <clears throat> humility uh, is not a weakness. Hum- humility is an excellent attribute. I think in the workplace, they have to, you know, they sort of get that at a high level. You know, philosophically, they agree with that. But then how do they express that in their day-to-day, day-to-day interactions? And the, the CEOs that I've worked with over time uh, have come to see it as a strength because, maybe going back to what Dylan was saying earlier, there are um, attributes of the culture that you need to be aware of. There's vocabulary. There are, there are thoughts. Uh, Same way across generations, right? There are ways that you have to adapt your message and so on. But humility cuts across that. (laughs) Humility is a a core value, if you will, of uh, a Christ follower, an obedient Christ follower. And so we have to get a business owner or someone of influence who people look to as an example to say, uh, yes, uh, be adaptable. Do what what Paul did. Do, Do all those things craft the message appropriately, but be aware of what the core values of a Christ follower are. Mm -hmm. And those things don't change, by the way. They're not changing. And so while we do adapt, we use different techniques, they're not changing. So, Bill, I would say this. I would say um, coaching them, encouraging them, using examples. Uh, These business leaders come to see humility as a strength because it shows their vulnerability it shows their, their own brokenness before Christ, and it shows their own sort of position of usefulness uh, before Christ. And they can take that to people who are wondering where I fit, how I matter, what's my purpose, all the basic worldview questions, and they can put their example out there and help others struggle through the, the, the questions of who am I, why, why do I matter, who is Jesus, how do I deal with this brokenness because I'm hurting? Does that make any sense? Mm-hmm. A great read, by the way, on humility, I, I find, is Andrew Murray. It's a real short book. Uh, it's titled Humility by Andrew Murray. And I try to read it at the beginning of every year, just a reminder. But it's, a, it's just a great read. I thought I'd throw that, throw that out there. Anybody else, any comment on culture or humility that we're talking about here before we Move to the next question. I, I, I wonder what the leadership consultant here would say about, is it, pos- is it possible to be too humble, do you think? Well, <laughs> I'm always going to go back to terms rightly understood, right? right? What do we mean by X? And so I think it's always, especially now, 
as terms constantly change and they're constantly co-opted by culture. And so we have to understand what do we mean by the words that we're using. So then it goes back to what, what is God's view of humility? And, you know, we talk about heavenly wisdom and earthly wisdom. And in James 3, you see wisdom from heaven is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, produces good fruit, and it's sincere. And so it's how, how, am, I, how am I demonstrating that? And I do think that that's a good, like, that's what humble looks like. What does healthy look like? What does humble look like? Um, and so I think it's important for us to, it's easy to slip into a world's definition of humility. What I constantly find, you see Gallup and all the research companies saying, this is what you should do to engage your employees. And then humble becomes a tactic. Everybody needs to be more humble. Everyone needs to be more vulnerable. So then people are awkwardly vulnerable and awkwardly humble at work. And it's like, whoa, that was uncomfortable for everyone. Um, and so being able to go back to what, what is the fruit? What does this look like? What does scripture say? And sincerity being a real piece of that. What's true? You know, what's true? And I think Christians, like, we can take what's true as a weapon or we can take what's true as, like, a mirror to ourselves and going, am I living out what's true? And if I could say one more thing going back to culture, do you mind? I'm going to pivot a little bit and then throw it back to you, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing, and we talked about this in our Faith and Work Consortium. Denise was there, and um, we, we talked about how there's a current message in culture. I know y'all probably hate social media, but you can see the trends of cultural narratives on social media. There's a current conversation among Gen Z, um, younger millennials, probably some Gen Alpha are absorbing this too, of work is evil. You need, to, you need to figure out how to escape work. And I think that that cultural narrative is something that we as believers and workplace ministers need to be aware of because work is good. It's a garden. Like, it's pre-fall. Work is good. And so if we allow this narrative to persist, we're going to get more and more frustrated. CEOs will be more and more frustrated. They are right now because people want more money for less work. Um, but it's also a way that the enemy is stealing joy and purpose out of the workplace where God intends to bring joy and purpose. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Comments on culture or humility? I know one of the things I hear often from our leadership and probably more often from our, from our chairman is Peter Drucker. He says culture trumps strategy. And, and, and then I hear, no, culture trumps everything. And there's a lot of truth to that, right? If you have the right culture, I mean, I look at our retention rates versus others in the beverage industry, and I mean, you have the right culture, it has a huge impact. What about excellence? We talked, even it came up yesterday morning during some of the other sessions about excellence. And sometimes someone could feel like, well, uh, I'm a Christian, I should attract, let's say it's an air conditioning or a plumbing company or electrical company, what, no matter what kind of organization it is, and uh, I should be able to attract people from my church to my business just because I'm a Christian, so therefore other Christians, but maybe they feel like I don't have to be as excellent or the quality of some of the others in the same business. Let's talk a little bit about excellence, about what God says to us as ambassadors for Christ uh, about excellence. I, I had the privilege of working with uh, physicians uh, a few years ago uh, over a long period of time, and uh, we were given the task of writing an evangelism workshop to teach them. It's a, uh, medicine is a very uh, constraining place to, uh, to, to live out your faith in some ways, and a lot of these people uh, were taught that you should never talk about your faith, uh, but uh, they, they went through their training at a very kind of odd time, uh, unusual time, when, when medical... Uh, schools were teaching the exact opposite of what they should, uh, and so. But that was the very first thing uh, that we taught them, and it was really fun listening to C. Everett Coop, you know, talk about this when he was Surgeon, Surgeon General. He said the very first thing that you have to do is practice good medicine if you want people to pay attention to your faith, and it was real easy. He says, you know, stand before, you know, when you're when you're. Uh, you know, beside the bedside, and you uh, and you try to ask them the diagnostic question. Pardon me, if you should die tonight, where would you spend eternity? That might not be the best way to start, 
uh, and we we would we'd get down to us. And some people, some of some of the physicians, would kind of argue with us about some of this. Uh, but I said, look, here, here's, here's where this fits in. Let me just give you this illustration. Your child is uh, very sick and life, in a th- with a life-threatening. Tell me, uh, fill in the blank here. I want the blank doctor in town. I want the most spiritual doctor in town. The most God- what, what do you put in there? You put the best doctor in town. Of course, it's great. You know, you want them to be godly, okay? But uh, that's, that's, the, you know, that's where work has got to speak for itself, and it opens doors when we do excellent work. Uh, Daniel is probably, and probably all of these Old Testament heroes, uh, they, ga- they gained influence by, first of all, doing outstanding work, uh, exemplary work. Now, that doesn't mean you're the best. God's not calling us to be the best out of what we do in town, but he is calling us to do our best work, the best work we can. Um, and uh, that's, that's very important to understand. It is re- it's really the first base, you know, toward having any kind of influence on people, whether it's spiritual or emotional or physical. So, Good, good. Yeah, I, I think this is something I care a lot about because it's, I've seen it done so poorly. Uh, not just in workplaces, but, I mean, we just think about Christian culture in general. Uh, you don't see uh, as, as, as uh, sweeping as it is and how much money comes in with it, but Christian music, Christian films, Christian TV shows, um, they're not good. Yep. <laughs> uh, and I'm sorry to say that, but most of them are not. And uh, that is, in my opinion, I just think... Uh, lacks, uh, like, just not good Christian art uh, is should be an oxymoron. Yep. Because as Christians, we worship the God who created all things, and that we're called to do all things quorum Deo, before the face of God. And that should result in us being the most diligent, the most incredible workers that God has created us to be. So whether you're in the marketplace or you're in the arts, you are called to do things with excellence because we're doing things for the Lord. This is why uh, I do think The Chosen, the TV series, has become so popular uh, because it is amazing. It is actually an amazing TV show. And I think there's a reason why it's resonating with so many people because it's actually gaining an audience because it is done with excellence. And that makes a significant difference when people, it's compelling. It is compelling as as uh, y'all were saying, it's compelling when people see us doing things with excellence. It draws them in. So, yeah, we, we, we need to do that. Yeah. No. No, you. Go. You. <laughs> you go first this time. Okay. I'm noticing a trend here. <laughs> so, how did God do his work? He did it so well. Yes. He did it so well. I was, I was in the Pacific Northwest, my five-year-old, we walk in this beautiful mountain clearing and we see the water and the mountains and all of this. And she goes, this is life. It's so beautiful. And it was amazing. And so then we, I said, who made this, right? And he did it so well that it causes worship. He did it so well. It's the point. And we are supposed to be image bearers of the one who did it so well. And then he evaluated it. He looked at it and he thought, anything I would change? Oh, he's alone. You know, like he he looked around and he evaluated it and he made adjustments and then he was like, it's good, right? So if we are gonna work Hmm. as our father has given us work to do, let's do it like he did it. Do it so well. Do it so well. Um, I want to make this very practical. Um, I hire people to work with me, and I've got eight guys that do what I do in uh, North Texas, and I tell them 28 and 98 is important. 28 pound, 98 brightness. Do any of you know what I'm talking about? It's paper. I mean, we, we print a lot of things, and we give them to our members and other people. And I say, we do not print on cheap paper. Yeah. 
It sounds trivial, doesn't it? But excellence is, is, yes, we have the concept. Yes, we have images and visions. But excellence is a thousand decisions every day. That's what it is. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's a, it's a habit. It's a recognition that it's integral to who you are and how God has created you. It's a, it's a call to worship. Uh, it's, not a, it's not only a concept. It is a thousand decisions you make every day of how I will represent Christ. Mm -hmm. um, we don't use cheap paper. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think that with that and what Jessica was saying, like, this is a fundamental motivation shift in terms of how we do our work. That I am, I love what you just said, Tom, because when we do work with excellence and we work to the best of our abilities, it is an act of worship. That's a category shifting idea from the ways that the world operates in terms of I'm going to work hard and do things really well so that I can get a ton of money, live the life I want to live, yada, yada, yada. But when we say, I'm going to work, I'm going to do the best work I can do because it's an act of worship, man, I mean, that is just so uh, persuasive, I think, to the people around us. Anybody else want to comment on this? Great. You know, I hear often, you know, excellence, I agree, that the we need to be excellent. People are watching, right? People around us are watching. Our employees are watching. Our customers are watching. Our vendors are watching. And, and they know that we're Christians. Boy, what a great opportunity to do everything we do with excellence. And that's why we have in our purpose statement, to honor God and all we do by serving others, pursuing excellence and growing properly. It's so important to us. It's part of our overall umbrella purpose statement and overall everything everything we do. So I, I appreciated the feedback that, 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 that all of you gave. What about like sharing our faith? You know, we talked about discipleship and evangelism and let, let's talk about sharing our faith with a coworker, or anyone or a relative or, or a friend or someone in your network and how important that is. I, I saw a Barnes this week, actually our church shared it about a year ago that said 90%, this was a Barnes statistic, and our pastor shared it, said 97% of all Christians had never shared their faith outside of their family in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, well, how would we get these recommits and salvations that we're <laughs> praying about that we'd hire non-believers and they'd get to know God if someone in our organization, like our chaplains or co-workers, are not sharing their faith? How important do you think that is and how do you think that can be done in an organization, sharing our faith with someone that does, that does not know God. We've got a minute here. Okay, so uh, yeah, it's obviously really important. There are times when people come into our lives and they are so totally ready to hear the gospel. They're, they're some hurt or something. Most of the time, if somebody is, has reached uh, adulthood in our culture uh, without trusting Christ, there are all kinds of barriers that, um, that, that come up. And I would suggest, Andrew Peterson has this great line. He says, if you want somebody to know the truth, tell them the truth. If you want somebody to love the truth, tell them a story. And if we can begin to open um, our hearts about what God has done for us in small ways, two-minute stories, to let them have a glimpse of what it's like to be a child of God, uh, just a little bit at a time and see what the Holy Spirit does with that. Uh, we might get a lot more opportunity to tell a bigger, the bigger story, the God story and our own story, you know, of how he led us to Christ. I love that so much. And I think um, one helpful thing, too, is that start, uh, start having the long view when you do evangelism. So, you know, in these kinds of examples that Jessica gave earlier, like evangelism, explosion, bridge to life, like we often pin like the decision. Did they make a decision for Christ? Um, we don't really see that in the scriptures. And I think Acts 17 is a great example of this where Paul is speaking to Ath the men of Athens. And at the very end of that, uh, when Paul gets done speaking, it says, Paul went out from their midst. Some men joined and believed him. Some mocked him after hearing about the resurrection of the dead. And some left curious saying, we will hear you again about this. 
So we see three examples of three different responses after Paul just shared the gospel, and the text at no point says that this was a failure. So we need to understand that when we share the gospel, some people will reject it outright. That's clear. Some people will be curious, say, this is interesting. I think I want to learn more about this. And some people will accept Christ as a result of it. So I think having those three buckets that we see in Acts 17 is so helpful because we see that no matter which response they fall into, it's not a failure. It's not a waste because you're planting those seeds and those responses could vary. I know we need to, I know we need to end. I will say I, I agree with this. There's probably nothing more important than us sharing our, our faith with others who don't know who don't know God and praying for, and also praying for those ones around us that don't know, know God. So praying for them and sharing with them, I think is, is paramount. And, and boy, God sure makes it clearly in scripture for us to do that and how to do it. Thanks. This 45 minutes was the quickest 45 minutes I've seen. Thank this panel.